Welcome to Brazos Matters. I'm Jay Sokol. This episode takes us to the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum on the Texas A&M University campus in College Station. That was the site of the recent unveiling of the new Marine One 4141 Locomotive Pavilion. It's a massive addition to the complex and the grounds that opened to the world in November of 1997. KAMU and Brazos Matters were part of the media event, and we wanted to share some comments from that day. We start with Andrew Card. He's the CEO of the George and Barbara Bush Foundation and the former Secretary of Transportation for the 41st President. Card's resume is way too lengthy to even list, but he later served as White House Chief of Staff under President George W. Bush. He also was the Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service. You might remember that. So let's start with the countdown to the unveiling and then hear from Andrew Card. We are 41 days away from celebrating George Bush's 100th birthday, which would be June 12th. And we're going to have a huge celebration on June 12th, but we're launching this 41-day count toward that birthday by exposing the train engine that brought him to his grave and has been wrapped in a cocoon inside the pavilion that was just added to the presidential library. So this is the first exposure of the train It's a permanent exhibit item that will remind us of President Bush and remind us of that day that was witnessed by the world. The world watched this train engine bring George Bush to College Station, Texas for his final resting place. It was one of the most watched transportation aspects of a show. And we've got the engine that made it possible right here. President Bush loved trains. He loved Union Pacific Railroad in specific. But... He was thrilled when he got to ride the train to come open the library, and he was thrilled to know that there were plans to have him taken to his final resting place where he would ride in a train and be shown respect on the campus of Texas A&M and be buried. One of the things I learned today was just how rehearsed that event was by the Union Pacific team. I I had not thought of that, and uh, one of the representatives was describing that to me. And, of course, it looked like it was executed flawlessly. What do you remember about that day? First of all, the day was unbelievably emotional. The president at a funeral in Washington, D.C., at the National Cathedral with world leaders coming. Then he had a celebration of his life in Houston, and then he boarded the train after it had flown, uh, he had flown from Washington, D.C. to Houston. This casket had been respectfully transferred from a plane, Air Force One, to a train being pulled by engine 4141. And the respect that was shown by the people along the train tracks, the whole journey from Houston to College Station was just remarkable. You saw cowboys on their horses ride out to greet him. You saw school children driving out with, with flags waving. And it was just a very moving time. And then when he showed up here, it was greeted by the Corps of Cadets and the Ross Volunteers. And it was just a very moving ceremony. The world witnessed that. They learned a lot about Texas a and L. They learned a lot about President Bush. And there's reason for us to celebrate his legacy by making sure people come to the library and see it. This train is going to draw a lot of people to come to Bryan College Station. People will want to see the train. and They'll want to go to the library and read about the life, see the pictures, see the events that took place, the remarkable experience he had as president and the contributions he made. And maybe they'll go down and pay respect to his grave that's only about 100 yards away from the library. So that's what this is about. This is about polishing and understanding and remembering the legacy of George H.W. Bush. Tell me what's parked right behind this locomotive. This locomotive is in a pavilion, and it shares space with a Marine One helicopter. And it happens to be a Marine One helicopter that the 
President flew on when he was vice president and when he was president. And it's amazing the number of pilots of Marine One helicopters that celebrated this helicopter coming to the campus of Texas A&M and to be part of the permanent exhibit here at the museum celebrating President George H.W. Bush. So this is really quite a building. This building can, 1,600 people could come in here and stand at a reception. 600 people could come in here and be hosted to a wonderful dinner. There's a little restaurant that's going to be part of this called Daisy's. So you'll be able to come in and have a meal here, but you'll be able to see the presentation of the exhibits, the train engine, the helicopter, Marine One helicopter, and they'll have other exhibits in this part of the build pavilion. And then you can go into the library and see the documents of the car or the, the plane that he was shot down on, the, the story of President Bush's life, a situation room, the Oval Office, even a little bit of what it's like to go to Camp David. So. If you want to find out what it's like to be the president, come down to this museum. You can see what it was like to be the president. If you want to see what it was like to be a great president who served one term and was probably the most successful one-term president in the history of the country, come and see the George and Baba Bush Foundation's contributions to the George Bush Presidential Museum. That was CEO of the George and Barbara Bush Foundation, Andrew Carr. Now, it was certainly a big day for everyone connected to the Bush Library and Museum and the Bush Foundation, but considering the crowd was standing in the shadow of that massive 4141 locomotive, it was clearly a big day for the team from Union Pacific Railroad. So here's UP's Senior Director for Public Affairs, Raquel Espinosa. This day means so much to Union Pacific because we have unveiled the 4141 George Bush locomotive which was unveiled to him uh, and it was a gift from Union Pacific. Uh, Union Pacific's employees, many of them are veterans and we've had a long relationship with the Bush family and of course the engine traveled across the country delivering America's goods and so many people would come out and take pictures as it would be going through different communities and it, it, it was a very, very special locomotive that has a lot of meaning to Union Pacific, but to the communities that we serve as well. And of course, it was our way to honor George Bush's legacy, uh, his service and commitment to our country. And we're just thrilled to see it here uh, in his home uh, displayed so that anyone can come a- and see it. it, it it's a beautiful display. How unusual is it for UP to actually donate an engine, a locomotive like this, to anything, anybody, anywhere? This feels unusual. You know, let me think about that. I, I can't think of another time when we've donated a locomotive, a modern locomotive like this. There are several steam engines in museums across the country but uh, this one is just everything about the George Bush 4141 is very special and it's not common for us to donate locomotives. They're first of all very expensive and they're always working. Uh, for us, if, if we've got a locomotive, it's out delivering goods. In this case, it was such a unique piece of American history that it just seemed very fitting to bring the locomotive here to the George Bush Library. And I know from previous experience with the City of College Station, that's where I spent a lot of years working in communications before I went to KAMU, but there has been a special historic relationship between UP and College Station. That's how College Station emerged, was because of this being a railroad stop for Texas A&M College. So really, there's probably a broader meaning and relevance for UP and 4141 outside even the the George Bush Presidential Library Museum, but really for this whole community and area, that's how it started. That's right. College Station is was named because this was a railroad town. It started off as a railroad town and Union Pacific has grown up together with College Station. It's been great to see the the college grow and it's just a long-standing relationship. And one of the things that I keep thinking about is the day when uh, 
the George Bush 4141 pulled President Bush's funeral train. Uh, that was a very touching day when the entire town came out to pay their respects. And it was just something that gave you chills as you saw his locomotive pulling uh, that train. And uh, it was just something else to see it arrive here in College Station. And so there are so many connections that are woven in here with Union Pacific, our relationship with College Station, our relationship with uh, the Bush Library. And of course, uh, that all stemmed from our relationship with the George Bush family. When this locomotive, locomotive was, was bringing President Bush to his final resting place, where were you watching it from? What do you remember? What stands out in your memory the most from that day? So I'll take you back to when Union Pacific was first approached about the funeral train. Uh, it was the Bush family's wishes. And for us, it was hard because you don't want to think of you know, such a great leader uh, and, and who was alive and healthy. And uh, you just kind of don't want to think about that. But as, as those discussions took place, uh, it, it, we of course said yes. And there was a small team that was working on that. And I was one of a few people who were there during the planning phase. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that we had to look at a lot of logistics. There was the part that would be in, uh, in spring, right? That was that component. And we had to, to, to travel to College Station. So through the years, we met several times rehearsed uh, and uh, found different issues that, that needed to be some tweaking with the plan. And then when we received the call about the news uh, of the president's passing, uh, we all sort of started to move everything to spring and to College Station in preparation. So I flew from Omaha, along with other of my colleagues, that's where we're, we're headquartered. And I was in spring orchestrating uh, some of the different components of what happened in spring. From the media side, I was organizing the, the media reporters who wanted to come in and, and, and do interviews there at the Aldine Westfield Auto Facility. Uh, we moved all of the vehicles out of there and then staged the train and we had those the the passenger cars were coming from from Iowa and just different parts of the system so it was it there was a lot to do in a short amount of time and it was just an experience where looking back you there were so many times that we met and rehearsed and the team executed that plan with absolute precision i mean think about the engineer her name is June, and she rehearsed having to, to position the engine in one particular spot because that's where they would be carrying the president off of the train. So it was just something where everything uh, was executed flawlessly, and that's because of the Union Pacific team and, and our, our love for President Bush and his, his service. And it just, just means a lot to be here today. That was Raquel Espinosa, Senior Director for Public Affairs at Union Pacific Railroad. The Marine One 4141 Locomotive Pavilion is not yet open to the public, but that will change during the free grand opening event on June 13th. That's the big celebration of 41 at 100, George Bush's 100th birthday. Complete information is at 41at100.org. That's 41at100.org. Now, just a bit west of the Bush Library and Museum Complex, sort of tucked away behind Eastwood Airport, is a place called Disaster City. It's an extremely realistic training ground for urban search and rescue teams from around the world. It's operated by the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service, or TEKS. It really does look a little bit like a Hollywood set 
for an apocalyptic movie. But that's where KAMU student content contributor Hannah Morris recently spent some time shadowing teams practicing for disaster response. Here's part one of Hannah's experience at Disaster City. When we think of first responders, we think of the hard work and bravery each person must have to take on a career that focuses on saving the lives of others. I believe that society acknowledges this bravery, but I don't think that a lot of people consider all of the training that is required. I recently had the opportunity to experience some of the trainings that our best and brightest first responders go through to simply be better at saving our lives. This was at Disaster City, a training facility owned and operated by Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service. K-9 coordinator Christy Borman broke down the basics of Disaster City for me. We've taken Disaster City and we've worked it into uh, as many real-world pieces that we could uh, based on disasters that we have responded to in the past. And then we have a bunch of our own teammates as well as some other folks from teams around the country here today uh, working through those scenarios so that they can learn all the things that we learned in the real world uh, and take those forward for more disasters in the future. Throughout my day, I got to look around at some of the impressive simulation sites, learn more about the value of the exercises, and talk to a few of the incredible individuals who make Disaster City so great. One of those people was director of Texas Task Force One, Jeff Saunders. We chatted about the almost 25-year-long legacy of Disaster City and why it is valuable to all of its trainees. The people that come here are really looking for a hands-on experience. Um, It is uh, one of the premier places in the United States that we can be able to simulate the conditions that they're going to find in a real disaster. Nothing about what we do in search and rescue is a safe, you can't say that it's a safe sport. Um, there's inherent risks in everything that we do, but we can, we can reduce a lot of those risks here in, in Disaster City. Almost all of the exercises conducted at Disaster City are replicas of previous disasters that these first responders have been deployed to. Saunders explained to me that this session's trainings focus on one specific scenario. This particular exercise is built off of a hurricane um, that came in from the Gulf. So all of these teams are using the skills that they have to be able to, first of all, find survivors. That's our main job is finding survivors. And then once we find those survivors, what is it going to take for us to extricate those survivors from the places that they are? So they're using special tools and specialized skills to be able to get those survivors out of those situations. Kenneth Larson, a search team manager for Texas Task Force One, has been coming to Disaster City since its inception. He explains that the teams who participate in these exercises bring a massive variety of skills that many of us don't even realize. So you bring together structural rescue specialists, engineers, medics, physicians, search canines, technical search specialists, and we're able to cooperatively work on a simulated disaster. As someone who has had his fair share of Disaster City trainings, Larson believes a controlled environment like this one is beneficial to each of the trainees. That ability to take lessons learned from previous disasters and put them into play here in an exercise where you have the time to stop and take an administrative break then gives the the task force members and the responders more tools in their toolbox when they go out the door next week or next month on a real disaster. I had the opportunity to venture into one of the training props myself, an apartment building that had collapsed. With my hard hat, gloves, and knee pads secured, I made the nerve-wracking crawl into one of the concrete openings to see for myself what conditions these first responders were operating in. These large-scale trainings required several task force members to be completed successfully, but volunteers like Michael Hernandez Jr., who sat in the rubble and waited to be found, also played a key role in Disaster City. And I came down here just to see uh, what Disaster City was. I've never seen anything like this. I was actually in the debris and was able to get pulled out from everyone doing the exercise. It was really nice to see. 
gotten there early. They did a search and rescue uh, announcement saying, uh, if you're able to walk, come towards me. They also sent out their canine. There was a dog that came and sniffed on me. <laughs> and I didn't know if it was part of it. But yeah, the dog was just like, we have one unconscious because that was my role to be unconscious. So they kept talking to me and seeing and I w- couldn't respond to them at all. They were able to pull me out and get their mechanics on, seeing on how were they going to get unconscious people out or seeing if anybody else was left behind. Although Hernandez isn't a task force member, his experience as a volunteer at Disaster City showed him just how important these types of trainings are. When stuff actually does happen in a real world event, uh, we're normally, we know how to handle it. We know what to do, what mechanics to do, what agencies, what coordination that can all work together and what doesn't work together. And I feel like days like this when it's sunny and bright outside, that's the days that you need to train for it. Throughout my day at Disaster City, I was constantly in awe at the massive training props and the number of trainees. However, what really struck me was the kindness and care from each task force member. Not only were they so willing to explain each of their roles to me, but their intense passion about what they do spoke volumes in each of our conversations. I have no doubt that Disaster City is training some of the bravest and brightest individuals on state-of-the-art ways to save lives, and I feel so fortunate to get to shine a light on this one-of-a-kind place. From KAMU, I'm Hannah Morris. So for those of you who don't know, a big part of KAMU's mission is to be a training ground for Texas A&M students who are interested in learning about the broadcast industry. So it might be behind a camera, helping produce a live event like a commencement ceremony or an Aggie Yell practice, or learning about marketing and event planning and writing digital content, or creating stories on campus around in the community through video or audio, like Hannah. So here's part two of Hannah's experience at Disaster City. Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service, or TEKS, hosts task forces from all over the country to come train at Disaster City right here in College Station. Each team is filled with firefighters, paramedics, and engineers who work through each simulated disaster to locate volunteer survivors. These exercises could take an entire weekend to complete, but some intelligent furry friends help the rescues go even faster. Texas Task Force One Director Jeff Saunders explained to me just how valuable these canine units are to both Disaster City and real-world rescues. People working on a pile, it would take four to five hours just working in a small area. A canine can do it in less than 20 seconds, 30 seconds, depending on how the handler moves them around. They train almost every weekend. Um, They train here in Disaster City at least once a month. We try to use them in all sorts of different scenarios so that we can see how they're going to work when they're out on a real disaster. I had the pleasure of meeting with some of the canine administrative team, as well as hearing from one of the handlers themselves. Canine coordinator Christy Borman walked me over to one of the disaster sites that was specifically constructed to train canines. This site was a house that had collapsed from a natural disaster, and it included mounds of planks and tunnels for the dogs to run through and locate survivors. When the dogs run across this, it's very much like what they experience in the real world, and we've set up many parts of it just to mimic that, right? There's a garage here with two cars parked inside, and we can hide people inside those cars like they were trapped as they were trying to leave. A disaster area. Um, there's also a storm cellar here. So just like we would have in places where tornadoes are common, people can be in the storm cellar and then debris can get blown across the top of the storm cellar. So you can't see where you would need to pull them out of or that they're even there. The dog can smell that, tell us where it is, and then we can rescue them from that storm cellar. I got to meet canine handler Tom and his dog Taz, or as they like to call themselves, TNT. The two of them have been a rescue team for five years since Taz was found roaming the streets of San Antonio. And it was when Texas Task Force noticed Taz's unique personality that they decided he would be perfect for the job. What we look for is toy drive. It's all about the toy. So we get somebody who like bounces a ball down a rescue or a humane society, and if the dog goes, ball! <laughs> That means it's a good search dog. And that's what Taz did. Tom explained to me what a typical rescue operation looks like with Taz. Taz is a live find dog. Some of his buddies find dead people, but Taz finds live people. So we've got victims scattered all over this place. We've got some really, really great people who donate their time and come out and volunteer to help us. They'll hide in the piles or in the buildings, and we set up different scenarios where the dogs can go find them. Taz has a real active bark when he finds somebody. 
And then he gets his toy. His toy is everything to him. The whole reason he does this is for his toy. Taz plays fetch. He loves to play fetch with a frisbee or a ball or something like that. But he knows when he works, he gets paid. Taz's abilities make him extremely valuable to the team. So they say that a canine's nose is a million times stronger than ours. When we walk into a pizza place, you smell pizza, right? Taz smells basil and cheese and tomato paste and flour and every little ingredient. His nose just goes crazy. And that's what is so great about the dogs. We can send them into small places. They don't weigh as much as we do. His nose will pick up something 100 feet away. And all of a sudden, his head will turn. And he'll go chasing after it. And then when he gets up there, he starts barking, Dad, 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 it's right here, Dad, 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 here it is. And then I give him his ball, and everybody's happy. Tom told me a bit about his deployments with Taz and how they as a team help speed up the rescue process. Taz and I have gotten to go to a couple really bad tornadoes up near the Red River, and the, all, the entire block is just leveled. And then we just kind of go from house to house, just like we would out here. We just go from rubble pile to rubble pile. And Taz will get through that rubble pile quicker than anybody else can. And that's what's so great about sending the dogs. In a matter of just minutes, he can tell whether there's somebody in that house or not. If there is, then we call and we ask for some help. If there's not, we move on to the next house. And that's how we do our job. It was great to learn all about the importance of these canine teams, as well as the special bonds formed between dogs and their handlers. Taz and I spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm with the Dallas Fire Department. So when I go to work, Taz comes with me. Every single day, Taz and I are probably better friends than me and my wife, but don't tell her that, okay? (laughs) From KAMU, I'm Hannah Morris. By the way, you can find Hannah's stories along with a story from student content contributor Rochelle Marthens under the title KAMU Student Perspectives. So over time, more and more stories will appear there, and we hope you'll take some time to enjoy those and sample what our students are learning and doing here at KAMU. Again, those stories are under the title KAMU Student Perspectives. You can find them in the radio section of the KAMU website or on our YouTube page or on the NPR app or your favorite podcast platform like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeart Podcasts. One more time, the student-created stories are under the title KAMU Student Perspectives. And as always, if you'd like to support this kind of work, we'd love that. Visit our website, click the Donate button to help KAMU continue serving you as Aggieland's Public Radio and Aggieland's Public Television. Brazos Matters is a production of Aggieland's Public Radio, 90.9 KAMU-FM, a member of Texas A&M University's Division of Marketing and Communications. Our show is engineered and edited by Matt Dippman. Learn more about us. Check out all of the Brazos Matters archives at kamu.tamu.edu slash radio. Or again, on the NPR app, YouTube, or on your favorite podcast platform. I'm Jay Sokol. Thanks for listening.